Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is Understanding Drupal. If you have any question, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me anytime. Uh, we've got a lot of content to cover, so a uh, little time. So let's get started. One thing uh, to notice that I am not uh, in a hurry. I really want you to understand all the different pieces. So if you think that we need to make a stop and dedicate more time to any specific topic, just, just let me know. My name is Mauricio Dinarte. Uh, my handle is in Arcon, and you can find me like that pretty much everywhere in the internet. Uh, my email and my user, uh, my Drupal.org profile. I am from Nicaragua, a uh, beautiful country, a lot warmer than here. And we have, you know, we are very meta. Uh, we have lakes and volcanoes, but we also have a big lake with an island with two volcanoes on one of which there is another lagoon, so you know, water, land, water, it's pretty nice. Uh, so I work for a company called Agaric. We are based in Boston, but we are a distributed team with people in you know, the States, Nicaragua, Mexico, Germany, and England. And this is what we're going to cover today. And uh, let's get started. First, before you know, why, why do I want to use Drupal at, at, at the beginning? So let's see some example of uh, Drupal websites, the White House, uh, weather.com. This is one of the top 10 websites in terms of traffic in the world, and it is the biggest for Drupal. It receives a, a oops. it receives over a billion visits per year, and we're having technical issues. Uh, so weather.com, uh, it receives over a billion visits per month, so Drupal can scale up to that point. Uh, the Grammys, so the thing about the Grammys is that the day of the event, they stream the whole thing, um, but not only, not only the video streaming, but also they have audio, like uh, interviews, text, images, you know, there is a lot of multimedia involved in this website on the day of the, of the event, and Drupal handles all of that. The Web Economic Forum, the thing to highlight here is that it is multilingual, including uh, uh, you know languages that are right to left or that do not necessarily use the U.S. alphabet. So Drupal can handle multilingual pretty easily. Examiner.com, uh, Naranja Tradicional de Gandia. So this is a website from Spain, and and they are a small business that they sell. Uh, Oranges, uh, tangerines, marmalade, uh, lemons, honey, and sweets. So, you know, small website, small need, and they use Drupal to power their business. So even though Drupal is used by really high profile websites, you can use it to power your own small business too. And Tesla Motors uh, is also running Drupal. We are not in the cars themselves yet, but we're trying to make it. Uh, at least we're on the website right now. And you know, what, what are some of the features that make Drupal so appealing? For one, it is its security. You know, as you can imagine, the White House needs a high level of security. So Drupal um, provides that. It is not bulletproof, but the good thing about Drupal is there is a worldwide team uh, dedicated to ensuring that the code itself is secure. And as long as, as, as soon as uh, the vulnerability is discovered, you know, they will release a new security update that you can download for free and install. So you, you can have some peace of mind. You don't need to be an expert in everything, and yet you will get the, the best security, best practices. Uh, as I said before, Drupal supports multilingual, and in the case of Drupal 8, it has been improved way, way uh, uh, more than it was in previous versions, so it's really powerful. You can uh, have e-commerce website uh, using Drupal. Uh, if you need high traffic, Drupal can scale to that. If you need, uh, you know, responsive behavior, if you need your uh, your website to adapt, uh, you know, to a cell phone, to a tablet, a, a desktop computer, a 4K monitor, Drupal will provide the tools so you can deliver the best experience for each medium. And as I say, like in the case of the Grammys, you can manage your multimedia using Drupal. Now, uh, what is Drupal? So Drupal, for the most part, and this is what I'm going to focus on today, is a CMS. And as, as a CMS, uh, is, it allows multiple people to participate in the creation of content. Um, and in, in this process, you will be able to have publication workflows. That is like, you know, if you have 
a newspaper and then you have an, a journalist who writes article, but then you need uh, a, an editor to review it and then a department in chief to you know accept it and make it public on the website, you can have that workflow or any workflow that you might need. Uh, you have content revisioning and that means keeping track of changes. So let's say that something inappropriate goes on the website, you will know who did the change and when, you will know what exactly was changed, and you will have the possibility to roll back to a previous version of the same content before the inappropriate thing uh, was published. And that is like, you just that comes out of the box. You just like say, yes, I want content revisioning, and then you get it for free. And you can also have granular control over the content of the website. Uh, let's say that you have an e-commerce website where you have different type of clients, like the regular client, the uh, VIP clients, and you want to show everything the same except for the price of the products. You want to give a discount to the people who are you know, VIP customers. So you can say, show everything the same except this particular information, which would be the price. Or you can say, I want to uh, block access, public access to all these subsection of my website, or including like all my website is private. So it is very, very flexible in what you can control and give access to people. Uh, Drupal is also a framework, and this is more for developers. And as a framework, uh, it allows you to extend Drupal beyond its original capabilities. For example, Drupal itself was never intended to be an e-commerce platform, but some people you know, wanted to use it for that, and they wrote some code to, uh, to allow for that. And also you can use Drupal as a, as a data store. Like if you have a backend application, uh, Drupal can be your content repository and expose an API to consume that content. And as you know, mentioned in the keynote today, uh, Drupal is a big community. We are like worldwide, thousands of countries, languages, people writing code, contributing. So you are not alone. Uh, you know, you get people from Nicaragua flying to Chicago just to try to teach you something. I hope I do my best there. But like, you for sure have a lot of local people here in Chicago and probably anywhere where you would live that will be able to give you a hand if, if, in case you need it. Uh, so some basic concepts. And before diving into the Drupal particularities, I just want to make a distinction between a website and a web page. So basically, a website is a collection of web pages. It can be one or many. In this case, let's assume that I have this website for a, for a company. The slash in the first uh, image represents the home page. Then you have an about page, a theme page, services page, articles, and contact page. And for example, for, uh, for articles, you will have also one page for each individual article. So you have in one website many pages, and in, in one page you have many elements. So you can say that you have headers, footers, sidebars, the main content in the middle. So we're going to learn what are, how Drupal call each of these pieces. So for example, if you want to modify one of them, you know what is the thing that you need to modify. Uh, so core. Drupal core, uh, it's the minimum required software that you need to run a Drupal project. If you don't have core, it is not Drupal. And it's just a package that you download and install in your server. Among other things, it comes with modules and themes. And it seems as a framework to build on top of, like to extend Drupal beyond its capabilities. Uh, important here are the modules and the themes. So what are they? The modules are responsible for adding function, functionality to the website. For example, let's say that I have a blog, a personal blog, and I want that every site that I write a new article, I want uh, you know, an, a new post automatically appear in my Facebook feed, or a new tweet automatically sent. So that is functionality, and that functionality would be provided by a module. Uh, in the case of themes, uh, they are the ones who control the appearance. That is the color scheme, the fonts to use, like the layout, uh, like the responsive behavior. If it, is, if it has to do with look and feel, uh, it is the theme responsibility to do. And in Drupal, there is a clear separation of, la, of what you know, is functionality and what is appearance. So for anything functionality related, use modules. For changing the look and feel, use themes. 
And then uh, we have the country repository. And this is uh, things that are outside of Drupal core. If it is not Drupal core, it is the country repository. And in here, we also have modules, themes, and distributions. And distributions are pre-packed version of Drupal aimed for a specific use case. For example, there are distributions for churches, for nonprofits, for restaurants, and then you just download this special version of Drupal and it comes with a lot more features tailored to that specific use case. There are some for universities, and in fact, a lot of universities here in the States, because they have so many departments and so many websites to a spin off, they create their own distribution, which is the basis for, like, let's say, a hundred or a thousand websites that they need to maintain. And the analogy in the image is that in Drupal, uh, we have a lot of uh, small pieces, let's say, module that they do one thing very well. And if you want to uh, build some functionality, you combine the proper modules to get the functionality that you desire. Uh, for example, uh, it is uh, possible that you want to have an image slider. So you can have one module to, that provides a functionality to manage the multimedia, like the images. There is another module that provides the functionality to list all the images that you want to include in the slider. And there is another module that provides the, like the JavaScript functionality for it to like rotate and do stuff. So you will be combining three different modules to, to provide these features. So sometimes this is like a little bit mind boggling, like what modules do I need to pick up? But like with time and a little bit of experience, it's like second nature. You know like the top popular modules, you know the modules that do this thing very well, and you just combine them. Um, uh, any questions so far? Okay, so let's go on content. So Drupal is a content management system. Let's see how it manages the content. The first concept to, to understand is node. So what is a node? Node is a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. Let's see this car. If I wanted to describe this car, what can I tell about it? I can say that it is red, it has only two doors, it has you know, some year of, of you know, year, make, model, the type of fuel it uses, how many doors, how many windows, and so on. So if I want to describe something in Drupal, I will use a node to describe that object or that idea. So the node itself is simply a container of information. Uh, this is a node in Drupal, so you can use node to store information about tangible, tangible things like a car or non-tangible things like an article, for example. And in Drupal, no matter what, all the nodes are going to have some properties that are common to all of them. Those properties include a title. Every node has a title. Uh, every node has information about who created the node and when. That is referred to the user who created the node and the timestamp, which is like the date and the, and the time. Every node has an internal identifier, which is a number. It starts with one, and it increments by one every time. So node one, node two, node three. Uh, you can access the, the every node in your website by putting your domain, like example.com, slash node, slash node ID. Because we humans you know, have some difficulties remembering numbers, like if I tell you, I wrote a new blog post, go to example.com slash node slash 558. Probably by the time you get home, you forgot already. So in addition to having that UID, nodes also have URL aliases, which is like, a, you know, words to describe the, the node. In this case, it says slash blog slash altering views results, which is uh, derived from the node title. So when you have a URL aliases, you can access a node via the alias or via the node ID. Um, we're going to see later that nodes can have fields and what fields are uh, used for. But in addition to what it is publicly or easily uh, visible, the nodes also have some uh, metadata information. For example, if a node is published or not published. Let's say that I am a journalist and I'm, and I'm writing an, art an article, then uh, maybe I don't have all the facts, I don't have all the information, but I want to start already working on the story. So I can start writing the note, 
and save it as unpublished so it will be only available for me and not for the general public. And then when I get you know the rest of the information, I go back to the node, modify it, complete it, and then I say it is published. So nodes have a publication status. Node also have uh, languages associated with it. So is this in English, in Spanish, in French, French, Hindi, or you know whatever? Uh, and there are other properties that every node has. Has. Okay, so we we saw the example of, about the cars. Can we have more wheels? Sure. Maybe let's say that um, I, I have a retail store where I sell cars, where I sell motorcycles, three cycles, monocycles, and so on. And I want to put that information on my website. These objects have different properties. For example, uh, a motorcycle doesn't have uh, windows or doors. A motorcycle does, doesn't go in reverse as far as I know. Um, so if in, in, in real life, we describe this in different ways. So in Drupal, we're also going to describe these different concepts in different ways. But we need a way to aggregate them or group them. And that way is called content types. So content types is an abstraction that is used to group nodes that share similar characteristics or represent the same idea. So in Drupal, if I want to have this example, I will have a content type for cars, I will have a content type for motorcycles, and so on. I can have a content type for an event. And the content type itself uh, will serve as a template to collect information from. You have a question? Are content types like, uh, can you have like parent child relationships? Can you have like vehicle and then bike and cup, like that okay. sort of inherit? Or so, the question is if the content types can have a parent child relationship, and the answer is no. Okay. Uh, you, you can accomplish things like that uh, using fields, probably, like having one. Overarc overarching content type, and then based on some information, you can say this is a motorcycle or this is a car, but, uh, but there is no parent-child relationship between content types. So uh, when I say that they serve as a template to collect information, it's like when you go to add a node of this specific type, you will be presented with a form, and that form will be the same for every node of that type. Let's say that we want to describe this event so this event has a date, has a location, uh, it has uh, a price of you know the cost of the event, it has how many people can come to the event, and so on. So that will be my template, and that is what the content I will provide. And once you do this, it will be easier to manage the, the information in your website. Uh, one, one, one thing to very important is that what is the relationship between content types and nodes? Every node is of a, has one and only one content type associated with it. So in this case, the, the numbers in the blue bubbles represent the node ID. So node ID 1 is an article, node ID 2 is a basic page, node ID 3 is a car, and so on. Uh, so one node is of one and only one specific content type, and one content type can have many nodes associated with it. And if you have a content type with zero nodes, uh, just delete it. If you're not using, just delete it. And if you have a content type with only a few nodes, consider if you can probably mix and match some, some nodes like together and uh, so you don't have many because the thing is that the more content types that you have, the more permissions you will have to configure down the road, and we're going to talk about permissions later, so keep the number you know, low is possible. And when I said that content types is the management of the information, is that I can easily tell Drupal, Drupal, you have nodes of 10 different content types, but I only want to show the ones that are of the car content type. So Drupal, you know, with very easy steps, We'll do that, and then I have all the nodes of, of cars only. But let's say that you know I am selling cars, and people come to me saying, I want a car, yes, but I also want a Toyota Yaris 2008 red. So how do I allow the user 
to, to do more granular searches, not, not only by content type, but by other type of information. So when you have that need, fields come into play. When you have the need to you know, be able to search for more attributes other than the content type itself, you use fields, and fields are awesome. So I think that is pretty self-explanatory. Let's move on. OK, who has used Facebook or Twitter before? At least once. Some people, others like, you know, don't use it. That's okay. I rarely use them, at least Facebook. So let's assume that I have this store that I am selling cars in Facebook or Twitter. Then every time that a new car comes, I put the information in a Facebook post. I put my images, I put the price, the description, everything. And I also send a tweet. Let's say that, you know, I, if my business is, is, is growing and I have a new car on sale every day. If you come one month later trying to find the red Yaris that was available three weeks ago, you will have a hard time scrolling through the feed to find what you're looking for. And not only that, uh, when, when you do this, this is called free text search. And free text search is not easily searchable because there is no consistency. People can write whatever they want. You know, some people write poems in Facebook, songs in Facebook, they upload videos in Facebook. There is no consistency between one post to the next. Uh, it is going to be really hard to extract useful information from it. So in general, free text search is not easily, easily searchable. Also, when you have free text search, you can get inconsistent data. For example, someone can, if, if you are asked to put a date for an event, someone can say November, like full uh, spell the, the, the month, 19, 2015. They can abbreviate the month. They can use numbers for the month. They can use uh, short four or two digits version for the year. They can use dashes instead of slashes. Or even if you come like in Nicaragua, we put the date and then the month. Well, here is month and day, and then day. So you know, when when you have that freedom to to write what in whatever format you that you want, you get inconsistent data, and that is also not easily easily searchable. You can also get invalid data. For example, how old are you? I am minus ten years old. Not possible. When is your birthday? February thirty first. No. Nope. Price. In this case, I have a dollar symbol, like a U.S. dollar symbol, with a currency of euros, that's not right. What is your email? Not a real email that, you know, you, you are missing an ad sign. What is your phone number? Hi, I'm beautiful. Happy face. You know, you can literally write that in a Facebook post or a tweet. And good luck if you try to find that information later. So all of these things make Drupal cry. So free text, inconsistent data, and invalid data makes Drupal cry. If you uh, want to make Drupal happy, you use fields. And why do we use fields? Because they enforce certain validation criteria. For example, uh, on, the, on the left, yeah, on the left, you can say that a field is required. So for example, if we are describing a car, we might say that it is required to define the make, the model, the year, the plate, and so on. Uh, in, in this case, in the, in the left, we have a number field. So for example, what is the cost of this event? It was $40, if I remember correctly. So it is required to set a price, and you have a minimum. M maybe uh, you can have the, the event for free, but you're not giving away money for people to come, so the minimum will be zero. You can also define a maximum. You can define, in, in, in a case of a price, like a prefix of US dollar, and uh, a suffix of USD. So when people enter the content, it is going to be very clear for them that you are expected to enter the currency of US dollars, and so on. Uh, another benefit of fields is that, depending on, on the field type, you get different validation criteria. For example, if you, in the right, we have an example of an image field. You can say, I want to allow PNG, GIF, JPEG, and JPG files in my, in, in my website. Uh, and people start uploading animated GIF with picture of cats. And you don't want that anymore. So you go to the field configuration, you remove the GIF, and people won't be able to, that, to do that anymore. And you are enforcing that through the fields. Uh, you can also define minimum and maximum resolutions. 
and so on. So every field type will, will have its own configuration and that will help you to make the data uh, consistent across the website. And when the data is consi consistent, you can later on search for that information very easily. And you know, with this, Drupal is so much happy. And if you want to make Drupal love you, what you have to do is, for every piece of information, you create one field. So for example, if I am describing a, a, an event, one field for the price, one field for the, for the location, one field for the time, one field for the capacity of people, and so on. For every piece of information, one field. And you need to choose the right type of field because as we saw before, every type will have its own peculiarities. Uh, for example, an email field will validate automatically that you have an, a valid email, like an add sign and a dot at least. So these are some examples of field types. There are more than this in Drupal, but uh, in, the, in the first line we, we see a text, you know, that's like one line of text. Drupal makes a distinction between one line and multi-line text fields. So if you need multi-lines, there is a field for that. Drupal also, uh, in, in the way it says established in 2006, let's say that this content type is storing information about organizations, and we want to know when they were established. That is a year, that is a number. So even though we are displaying text internally, that is a number field. And let's say that I am only interested in, in organizations that were established in 2010 onwards. So in the field configuration, I can say, this is a number, and the number has a minimum of 2,000, and has a prefix of established in. So people will only enter a number, they won't be able to write text or, or symbols or anything. Drupal will make sure that you are writing a number, but when printing the information to the user, Drupal will automatically prepend the text established in. So you get the consistency, but you also get the, like the, the, the validation of the information. As we saw, we can also have images, we can have URLs, we can have phone numbers, we can have uh, emails, we can have dates, which includes the date and the time, and weighted services, that is a taxonomy field, and we're going to talk about taxonomies later. Uh, okay. Fields are awesome and they can do so many things. So let's continue talking about fields. When you have uh, a field in Drupal, they allow the user to enter the information in one or more ways. Let's assume that we, we want to, to, to identify the location of this event. So, you know, a location is a point on the earth. How can you enter that information? Well, it is up to you to provide, uh, you know, do you want to to have an address field, they just type like the, the words, and there will be a service that automatically geocodes that. Or do you want to allow the user to enter the latitude and longitude? Or instead, do you want to display a map for the user and ask the user to click on the map to identify the location? Or, you know, in the same day, way that we have PDF, Word documents, and so on, there are some specific uh, field file types like KML that are used to store uh, geographical information. So in theory, you can have a file upload field where you upload a KML file and that will extract the geographical information. So one field has the flexibility to enter the information in more than one way. And then it will make that informa information consistent within Drupal so it can be presented in more than one way. And the way that the information came in doesn't need to be the same as the information goes out. For example, you can enter the information as an address, like a text address, and when presented to the user, you, you show a map. So Drupal will take care of storing the information in a consistent way, and then you, know, you have the flexibility of entering in, in different ways and exposing in different ways. And in addition to just exposing the information, you can aggregate that information. So this is a real website uh, uh, called Drupical. Uh, this website uh, includes information about events happening worldwide. And as you can see, we are a worldwide community with events all the time. So in this case, 
They have a content type to store information about the events. One of the fields is the location, and with the, with the location field, they put a pointer on the map, but they have more fields. For example, they have a field for category, and they use that other field to color code the type of event. So in Drupal, you can combine information from different fields and present it in one aggregated way. So like in this case, you have the, the marker for the location field and the color for the type of event. And on the right side, you can see the title, the date, the location, and so on. So Drupal is very flexible in the way that it collects and presents information. And because fields are awesome, you know, they can do more than that. You can individually show or hide fields of, uh, uh, for, for a specific content type. What this means is that you can safely collect more information that you present. Let's say that uh, uh, in, in the case of, of having two types of customers, like the regular price and the VIP price, you can collect more than needed and then present to the user only what is relevant for their case. And you know that that have a lot of use cases. You can collect private information that is not shown publicly, or that is only shown to people within your organization. Like let's say that we have information about a staff in a university, and we have their phone numbers, their emails, and so on. But we want to have a page on the website where we show like pictures, title, position, and so on. But we don't want to show the email and the telephone so they don't get you know, called at midnight by students. So we collect that information, but when presented, we hide that. And we only show it for people in the faculty themselves so they can call each other at midnight if they want. Uh, so with fields, you know, it's what, you know, if you have, like in Facebook or Twitter, when you, where you have a big chunk of text, it is really hard to just take, let's say, I don't want to show line three, I mean, it's all or nothing. But when you have fields, you can like individually say, I want to show this or I want to hide that. So this is like the summary of what fields are ab able to do. Fields are used to structure the information and that <coughs> refers to the, you know, the different field types. Uh, they say discrete pieces of information, like again, one field for each type of information that you want to, uh, to store. And they, with, with fields, you can filter, sort uh, information. You can collect and display the information in different ways. You can show and hide per field on a field basis. So, so far, we have only covered the middle of the page here. So, in Drupal, in a Drupal page, the middle of the page would be a node. That node would be of one specific content type and that content type will define one or more fields. Let's say that in this case there is a title field, a tag, tagline field, an image field, and some body text field. So, so far we have only covered the center. Three different concepts, a notes, content types, and, uh, and fields. So before going any further, any questions here so far? Is it too confusing? <laughs> okay, I, ho I hope not. So, what about the rest of the page, the things around the main content? Everything around the main content is a block. So what is a block? A block is a container of extra information to display along the main content of the website. Uh, blocks are placed in a theme region, and this is a little detour to explain what theme regions are. So we said before that the theme is the one responsible for uh, for the layout of the website. The theme has a concept of uh, regions. So in this case, when we install Drupal out of the box, it comes with a blue shade uh, appearance. That is a theme called Bartik. The theme called Bartik defines all these regions, like the, white, the yellow rectangles are regions. So wh whenever there is a rectangle, you can place content, you can place a block. So for example, you can have uh, a block on the right side, but on the left side, but on a footer. One important thing to note is that the behavior of the regions is determined by the theme itself. For example, it's not very clear in the image, but there is a featured top region 
When you install Drupal, uh, you don't see that by default. In, in the image, you can see that feature top has a background of gray. And when you install Drupal, you don't see gray at all. Why? Because Bartik says that if there is no block in the feature top region, that region will collapse. And by collapse, it means that it will, that space will disappear. Uh, the same with the sidebars. So if you have no content on the left sidebar, it will collapse and that space will be used by the main content uh, uh, region. If you don't have content on the right sidebar, that will collapse and that space is going to be used by the uh, content region. So how regions behave is going to be defined by the theme. And not always that behavior is going to be collapsing. For example, Bartik has four footer regions at the bottom. If you, uh, if you put some content in the second footer region, it won't expand automatically if there is no content in the other ones. It's in, in, in that case, it will use just the space that is bound to it. So the, you will like need to give it a try with your theme. How does the regions behave? Okay, but we only talk about theme regions to understand that this is where we place block, where this is where we can place content. And if you start a new theme, it will come with new regions, totally different. So blocks, blocks can display static and dynamic content. Uh, in the in static refers that the content that is being shown is the same or almost the same every time. For example, if you have a copyright text at, at the bottom of your website, that will change probably once a year, like copyright 2016, 2017, 2018. So, in, you know, even though it changes, it rarely changes, like once a year. Also, you know, in an event like this where we have sponsors, we, we might want to show a banner of the sponsor in every page of the website, so that that content is in theory static. So we can, we have static blocks. We also have dynamic blocks, which they change regularly. For example, we can have a blog that shows the most recent articles. If you write an article every day, that blog will be changing every day. Uh, you can have a, a blog to display the latest products in your store. If you have new products every week, that will be changing every week. Um, blogs can also enforce visibility rules. And what this is, is who can see this information? So you can define visibility rules based on language. For example, this blog is available only on the English version of my website or in the French version of my website. You can also define uh, rules by content type. For example, if I have a blog that sh shows more articles by the same author, it makes sense to have that blog in the article content type, but it doesn't make sense to have that blog in the event content type because there won't be more events, I mean, there won't be more articles by the same event, that, that doesn't make any sense. So you can define that. You can also define rules by page, that is by URL. Let's say I want this blog to appear in the front page. I want this blog to appear everywhere except in the services section of my website. I want this blog to appear only on the contact page of my website, so you can do that. And you can also use rows, and uh, we're going to talk about rows later. And remember that modules add functionality. There might be some modules that provide more functionality for visibility rules. For example, I want to show uh, this blog only on Wednesday. There might be a module that allows you to define visibility rules by day. Blogs can also be aware of the environment where they are printed. Uh, let's say that uh, we have these more articles but the same author. So let's say that we are displaying a page, one specific node, uh, node five. And node five was written by John Doe. So on the same page, I want to show more articles written by John Doe. So when the blog is going to be displayed, it will ask the page, okay, who is the author of this node? Okay, John Doe. And then it will check in the database what other articles has John Doe written, and it will show them. So if, when, when it goes to Lisa Park, it will show different information based on each specific author. So you, you know, in that sense, blogs are aware of, of their environment. So you can also have you know, more vehicles on sale in the same city. If you put a different city, you will get a different listing. And blogs, in the same ways as content types, can have fields. 
So, for example, we can define a special offer block that will be displayed on the sidebar of my website always until the expiration date comes. So when this, uh, this special offer block will have a title, a description, an image, and an expiration date. So as long as the expiration date hasn't come yet, it will be shown. As soon as that happens, it will be hidden. So blocks can have fields. And the possibility for blocks to have fields is new in Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, you use a module called Bean, B-E-A-N. So if you need that in Drupal 7, you can use that module. In Drupal 8, it comes with Drupal core out of the box. Okay, views. Have you ever heard of views? Is it terrifying? A little bit? Okay. Views uh, is a mechanism in Drupal that allows you to list information in your website. Every time that you think of a listing of some sort, think of a view. It can be a view of notes, of users, of comments, taxonomy terms, and so on. So what, what does a view do? Views scan the content of your website, all the content of your website, and it will, based on the criteria that you specify, filter out that information. And this is where fields come into place. You can say, I want to configure a view to show notes of type car, where the field for color equals red, where the field for me equals Toyota, where the field for model equals Yaris, and so on. And once you collect the list of notes that you want to present, the view will give you the possibility to show it in different formats. For example, you can have an HTML table, you can have a PDF, you can have a Excel document, a CVS, and you know, a map. So uh, a view will provide a way to show the same information in different representations. And this is an example of a view. In this case, uh, in the first column, uh, we can see that we have the plate, a dash, year, make, and model. So one thing to take into account is that internally, those are separate fields. Remember that I said use one field per type of information. So in Drupal, you can have those, that information separate, and then when you, you create a view, you say, you know, view, I want you to concatenate this, this information. I want to present this information together. So that's how that was configured. Also, we have uh, this image. One thing that is not noticeable at first, but it's very powerful, is that all these images are of the same size and aspect ratio. Let's assume that we are all part of the team that are uploading pictures of, to the website, and we, and we do it using phones. Every phone has a different resolution and so on. So in Drupal, there is a system called image styles that no matter what size or format or aspect ratio the user uploaded the image, Drupal will automatically process that and you know scale it to certain size and crop it to certain aspect ratio. And you can do things like, for example, put it, put it in grayscale automatically or you, you know, watermark the image like with your domain name and so on. So that system is called image styles and it's a way to process the images automatically. And then we have color, uh, transmission, and field type. When you have a view uh, in that in, as a table, you can configure the view to be clickable, like the headers, so you can sort the view itself. Uh, you can also have uh, like pagination. Pagination is like if you have a hundred cards, you don't want to show them all at once. You might want to show ten at a time. So Drupal will show ten, and then at the bottom, like with numbers one, two, three, four, you go to the next page to see more cards, and also. Uh, the thing at the, at the top, where it says gear, make, model, sort by order, those are called uh, views exposed filters. And what that allows you to do is that, okay, I came up with some default uh, filter criteria, but I want to empower the user, the user visiting my website to do their own searches. So they can search by a specific gear, by a specific make, model, and so on. And when you apply the exposed filter, the view will refresh itself to respect that search criteria. And one thing to note is that 
Probably 80% of the time when you visit a page, the page is a node, but it won't always be a node. In this case, the page was the result of a view. And the thing on the far uh, top left, that is a block. And if you see, uh, uh, it says random car. That block was created with a view. Usually views are used for listing of some things, but there are some cases where it makes sense to have a view of only one element. For example, when you want to show something random, or let's say you want to show the most popular article, you want to show the most visited page, when you want to show the most of something, you can use a view to list that something of one element. And why so much theory? Why do I need to understand all of this in order to work with Drupal? Well, in Drupal, we love Nest. So if you're a front-end developer, you will know that we love nesting or markup. So to print one line of text, we have like 10 level dips of markup. Uh, we also, and you know, we also nest concepts, just like Matroska does. You have one concept encapsulating another, encapsulating another, and so on. So let's finish with the following example. I have a blog that shows more articles by the same author. So I will interact with at least five different concepts. One is the theme region, because the blogs need to be placed somewhere in the website. So you place the blog on the right side region. Then you have the blog itself, which is more articles by the same author. The blog was created using a view. So there comes into place the view. The, the, the blog itself is showing nodes, so you get node information. And from that node, you get like fields, for example, the, uh, the title, the date of publication, the category of the node, and so on. So for one piece of the whole page, you are interacting with five different concepts. And it is important to identify which piece of the puzzle it is, because if you want to change that, you need to go to the proper configuration page for that the proper configuration page for a view, for a node, for a field, and so on. So that's why it is very important to know that. And you know, in, for assembly one single page, you can interact with dozens, if not hundreds of, of these little concepts. And yeah, so unfortunately we ran out of time. As I said before, there are recordings with the whole thing, but starting here, you can just check the slide and it's, it's what I would have said. Anyway, so if you have any questions, feel free to come to me and thank you for your time.